not only to share the platform with him, but to present to you our speaker this morning, who will inspire you with his talk, Reverend Michael Record. And the, yes, it's right in front of me. I didn't know I had permission to share the topic. Can we talk to God is the topic. And it's from inspired by the book by Dr. Ernest Holmes. Remember, we started off with a quote from it. So help me to welcome Reverend Michael Record. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. Good morning, friends. It's a wonderful morning here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. You here in the center can appreciate the beauty of the morning, the blue skies, the brownish green grass, the glorious flowers, the bougainvillea, lovely, lovely golden sun. It's really quite beautiful. You listening to me online will simply have to take my word for it. You can't see it as we can. This morning's talk will be on one of the many, many interesting books in the center's book room, Can We Talk to God? It is by Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science, the religion and philosophy that we follow. It's one of the earliest of the dozen or so books that he wrote, and it was compiled in 1934 from lectures he gave in Los Angeles, California. It is a book full of discussion and explanation about spiritual matters based on fundamental tenets of our teaching, which is science of mind. Tenets like these. One, there is a power and presence in the universe which responds to us. Our communication with it causes it to do something. Two, it responds to our communication completely, perfectly, 100%, not half-heartedly. Third tenet, the power operates for us, that is, it supports us, and it does so by operating through us, that is, by using the physical, intellectual, and spiritual parts of our own selves to give that support. Fourth tenet, we communicate with that universal power and presence, and it's universal because it's, it's out there in the universe, by means of the part of it which is indwelling within us. I am saying that the power and the presence that is inside us is the one that is out there in the universe guiding the mighty rivers, building the huge mountains, energizing the cities, powering the planets, moving the moons, making the stars to shine. How do we communicate with it? We communicate with it through thought. We control it by merely thinking. Wow. wow. <laughs> In the book's 12 chapters, those concepts and others are discussed and debated. Dr. Holmes also, in addition to those discussions on those to topics, he also gives us some instructions and prescriptions about communicating with God and with one another. And I have selected 10 from 10 chapters for you. One, chapter one, 
titled, Can We Talk to God? It points out that there's a difference between talking at God, which is the ancient way of trying to communicate with God, and talking to God. In talking at God, we felt as though our prayers ascended and hit a divine air of a huge person somewhere up in the sky. That was the old way of thinking. That person might or might not respond, just as persons here on earth might or might not respond to our efforts at communicating with them. In the new order, though, the science of mind order, Dr. Holmes says we think of God not as this person in the sky, but as I quote, universal principle, intelligence, and power, as a universal and infinite being, as perfect law, the immutable law of cause and effect. Divine principle is a law of God. I quote Dr. Holmes, it is a mental law of cause and effect, divine principle. How do we talk to law? Dr. Holmes writes, when you impress your thought upon it, it is its nature to take that thought and execute it exactly as you think it. If there is destruction in the thought, it must destroy. If there is good in the thought, it will execute the goodness of healing." Unquote. Dr. Holmes, however, points out that thinking of God in this new way as law could cause us to lose what he calls, I quote, a sense of personal contact with this invisible power, unquote. So in trying to reconcile God as intelligence, as law, with the personal God that we instinctively want, he writes, I quote, there is something in us which longs for the sympathetic understanding, the kindly response, the sense of a presence which is warm, pulsating, and colorful. I sense, he says, that as we meet each other in love and friendship, in the warmth of a handshake, and in good fellowship, that is God. In each other, through each other, we contact God. When we talk to each other, I think that God is talking to God." Unquote. So in that first chapter, Dr. Holmes says, we can talk to God as intelligence, as law, using, using thoughts. But when we want to talk to God in a warm, personal way, we talk to God as other people using our ordinary means of communication, speech, etc. Chapter two, titled The Unity of God and the Individual. The highest perception of mankind, Dr. Holmes writes, has been our sense of an inner oneness with the Spirit. And there is an important consequence of our feeling this oneness. I quote, the more completely we become conscious of this divine union, the more power we have over our own existence." Unquote. And he cautions us not to think to limit the matter of the unity of God and person to the religious fields only. That has been one of the great mistakes of mankind he says, because God is all in all. God is God in everything. The gardener, for example, finds God in the seed. The geologist finds it in the rock. The scientist finds God in the energy of the atom. Now, I find this little anecdote most instructive. 
Holmes writes of Brother Lawrence, a Carmelite brother in the 1600s, who was noted for his prayerful life. He was so immersed in the feeling of union with God that he reached a stage of perception where it was impossible for him to pick up a straw without realizing it was God acting through him. And Jesus let us know in a number of statements that he often felt this sense of union. You'll remember his well often quoted statement, the Father and I are one. Holmes point, points out that, quote, in mental and spiritual healing, the important thing to emphasize is the presence of good and its perfect unity with the individual. That's how treatment works, which brings us to the third chapter, titled Law, the Servant of the Word. And there Holmes writes, I quote, treatment is the act, art, and science of specializing the universal law of mind for specific and individual purposes. The law is, but it must be used. Until the time comes when we use it consciously and constructively, we shall be using it unconsciously and perhaps destructively." Unquote. He points out that every time we think, we use this law. And this is an echo of his statements at the back of our programs. Would you please turn to them for me at the back, inside back cover, and read the first four with me. As I say, it echoes what he was just saying. A new way to think. Together, there is a power for good in the universe, greater than you are, and you can use it. There is no question about the creativeness of thoughts. If any thought is creative, it must follow that all thought is creative. The law of mind is exact. The only question is, how are we going to use this creative power within us? Shall we use it constructively for a definite purpose, or shall we use it destructively merely because we do not understand it? Thank you. There is where Dr. Holmes was echoing. If we don't use it consciously, we shall be using, obviously, we shall be using it unconsciously and perhaps destructively. Holmes tells us how to avoid using the law of mind destructively. I quote, we should begin by weeding out all negative states of thought and learn to speak a straight alternative language. The universe gives to us through us, all natural laws await the intelligent, guiding hand." Unquote. Chapter 4 is titled, The Energy Back of Thought. Dr. Holmes has a quote. The most penetrating and far-reaching conclusions ever made to humankind have announced that creation is the result of the contemplation of God. Let me repeat that. Creation is the result of the contemplation of God. The law of the universe propels mind into action, action into creation, with creation being an effect, a result, the creative word of universal intelligence projects itself into form." Unquote. Holmes is telling us that the energy backing up thought, or the word, created the universe. We can compare the process with the references made to the creative power of the word in the opening verses of Genesis and the Gospel of St. John. 
In the former, we read that in the beginning, there was emptiness, a void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what happened? God spoke the universe into being, the heaven, the earth, and light, plants, animals. And in St. John, we read about the same creation of the world and light. These are the first couple of verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men." Unquote. Holmes says the energy behind thoughts can only respond by correspondence. What does that mean? The measure of our faith in the infinite is the measure of our capacity to draw from the infinite. Your faith equals your capacity to draw from the infinite. As Jesus said, Holmes reminds us, it is done unto you as you believe. And that was 2,000 years ago. And if it was true, and it was true thousands of years before that, as many Old Testament stories tell us. If then, for thousands of years, thousands of stories tell us that faith in God works, I think we should begin to believe it. Chapter five, spiritual evolution. Holmes says in this chapter that the evolution of humankind is purposeful. There is a purpose about our life. Now that is good news, for many of us have asked whether our life has any meaning. In fact, mankind has asked that question throughout the ages. Some, like atheists for example, existentialists, say that there is no ultimate purpose to life. You are born and then you die. But Holmes says if you look at history, the history of mankind, you can see signs of a purpose. With evolution, for example, simple life forms become complicated life forms. And simple organisms move through the stages of being unconscious to having elementary consciousness. And eventually, there comes the self-consciousness that humankind has. But you may ask, why was evolution of body and soul necessary? Why didn't God simply make us the way we are now, the whole universe, the way? It, why didn't he make it, the universe the way it is from the very beginning? Why bother with this evolution thing? And then why do our souls have to evolve? Why weren't we made all wise, all powerful, like God? After all, we were made in his image and likeness. Holmes has, for me, a really good answer. I hadn't quite thought about it in this way. He says that the answer lies in the concept of individuality. Spirit, because it is infinitely creative, logically has to make many different things. A painter who is infinitely creative is not going to paint one thing. He's going to paint a lot of things. So with infinitely creative mind. And Holmes points out that individuality means spontaneity, self-choice, volition, creative ability. That comes with individuality. Individuality presupposes choice which presupposes the possibility of bringing choice into actual experience. That is, if you have choice, you have to exercise that choice. You can't just keep that choice as mere unused potential. And Dr. Holmes puts it quite poetically. I'll read, the, I'll read it. Only through experience can it come full-orbed into conscious unity with the divine mind. 
When we reach self-consciousness, spirit can do nothing more for us until we consciously cooperate with it. Since human beings first said, I am, nothing has been forced upon us, unquote. The law Order of animals operate by instincts, unlike us. They don't have freedom of choice. We do. And hence, we have individuality. Chapter 6 is called Unbecoming Receptive to the Divine. We often hear that each one of us is an individualization of the universal spirit. That's a common saying here, we're God individualized. But what does that mean? I quote Dr. Holmes. How is it that the eternal mind, the one back of everything, can differentiate and person personify itself in numberless ways without changing its nature? That question is asked, and he answers it using a really good analogy. In the garden, he says, there are dozens of varieties of plants. All come from one creative soil through one law in that soil, all rooted in the same medium, each bringing forth according to the nature of the seed involved." Unquote. So just as a soil makes a mango seed, produce a mango tree, and an ackee seed produce an ackee tree, so too the one creative mind produces individual human beings, and dogs, and cats, and so on. In the chapter, Dr. Holmes says that if we become receptive to the one infinite mind surrounding us, we become connected to everything else. Now think about that. When we become receptive to the one infinite mind, we are connected to everything else. I mean everything. That makes each of us potentially infinite too. In everything, every good we could desire, infinite abundance, infinite knowledge, infinite love, etc. Here's a quote. If we make ourselves receptive to the idea of love, we become lovable to the degree that we embody love. We are love. If we make ourselves receptive to the ideas of peace, poise, and calm, calling upon these divine realities, we find them flowing through us, unquote. And then he adds, when the universal mind flows through the individual, it comes to the surface of the conscious mind as an actual experience. For example, a consciousness of abundance will manifest as actual, tangible abundance. Abundance of money, cars, houses, clothes, and if you are so inclined, of horses, giraffes, and elephants. Everything is everything. You are connected through the universal mind to everything. Principle and practice is chapter number seven. Well, the seventh chapter that I'm dealing with. Holmes identifies the fundamental principle of mental and spiritual science as the fact that we are surrounded by an infinite intelligence. We have spoken about that a number of times. But here's the thing. Being intelligent, we can sense the presence of that infinite intelligence, even though it is beyond our full comprehension. We sense it as an intelligence great enough to encompass the past, to understand perfectly the present, and to be the creator of the future. We sense it as the cause of everything that has been and is that, out, and is that out of which will unfold everything that is to be. And our own intelligence is one of its activities. 
and is of like nature to it. Our intelligence is the same in essence as that universal intelligence, though not the same in degree. It's like that gold chain that you have on is like all the gold in the world, but you only have a piece of that gold on your chest or around your neck. Now the nature of creative spirit means that it is ever ready to create. The greater our receptivity and comprehensive comprehension, the more complete its flow. Obviously then, our job is to increase our receptivity and comprehension. The more we do, the more creative we become. Prayer and treatment. In this chapter, Dr. Holmes asks a question that many of us have asked. To wit, why is it that one person's prayers are answered while another's remain unanswered? We've all asked that question at some stage. How come when she pray for so and so, she gets it when I pray? Dr. Holmes explains, and I quote, it cannot be because God is a respecter of persons or has greater consideration for one than for another. It must be that all persons in their approach to reality receive results not because of what they believe, but in spite of the peculiarities of their belief. It must be the way of their belief that makes the difference. In other words, it's not because you're a Catholic or an Anglican or a Baptist or a Muslim that when you pray, your prayer is either answered or not answered. It's not because of what you are, it is because of the way you express your belief. Dr. Holm explains, the mind can accept or it can reject but it cannot do both with the same proposition. The man cannot accept what it rejects. It cannot embody what it denies. It will not accept what it refuses to believe. Prayer, faith, and belief are mental attitudes." Unquote. And he illustrates healing as a two-step process. First, the faith of the person praying praying, heals the sick, and secondly, God raises him up into regular physical activity. So he says that there is a human act, prayer with faith, followed by an act of God. And he says that without the human act, the act of God will not follow in prayer. The prayer of faith makes it possible for the Lord to respond and to do the thing Desire. Take the resurrection of Lazarus, for example. Jesus prayed, expressing faith in God, then called Lazarus. Lazarus must have been resurrected by the prayers before he could come forth. Make sense? So there's a prayer, and then there's an activity. In this ninth chapter, Dr. Holmes explains spiritual mind treatment, also known as affirmative prayer, in this way, I quote, practitioners think within themselves about someone after definitely stated for, for whom this word is spoken. We seek to realize the spiritual, mental, and physical perfection of this person. We do this in our own minds, and since our minds are functioning in the universal mind in which each individual mind functions, the realization will rise to fulfillment in the one desiring help according to his or her receptivity." Unquote. And Dr. Holmes cautions, we must be sure to incorporate in each treatment or prayer the realization that all people are surrounded by a perfect wisdom which guides them 
a universal law of good which protects them, unquote. And if the practitioner has any reason to suppose that the client doubts that he's surrounded by a perfect healing mind, the practitioner must form his or her treatment in a way to overcome the doubt. That means you can't force a treatment on someone or a nation of people who are not receptive. I'll never forget Dr. Elmer telling a class about a woman who had kept praying for her 40-year-old son to get married and give her grandchildren. When nothing happened for a long time, she told her son what she had been praying for. He was very surprised. But I don't want to get married, he said. Those who pray for others will probably find this paragraph here as interesting as I did. There are certain underlying fears which are common to most people. The fear of pain, suffering, poverty, death of the future and the hereafter. The fear of being misunderstood and what we might call the fear of the world. These fears practitioners must neutralize. We must establish in the client the realization that there is nothing to be afraid of before the prayer will work. And in the final chapter, what I believe, Holmes waxes very poetic, and I'd like to read a few paragraphs verbatim. Holmes says, I believe that God is universal spirit, the life essence of all that is, an intelligent power which permeates all things and which in each individual is conscious mind. I believe that humankind is a direct representative of this divine presence on this plane of existence. If we are divine beings, why is it that we are so limited and forlorn, so poor, miserable, and unhappy, most of us? The answer is that we are ignorant of our own true nature, and ignorance of the law excuses no one from its effects. We are individuals and have free will and self-choice. We shall learn by things, experiencing things, mental and physical. There is no other way to learn, and God himself could not provide any other way without contradicting his own nature. Spirit is subject to the law of its own nature, and so are we. He continues, in conclusion, I do not believe in hell, devil, or damnation, in any future state of punishment, or any of the strange ideas which have been conceived in the minds of morbid people. God does not punish people. There is, however, a law of cause and effect which governs all and which will automatically punish impartially impartially and impersonally, if we conflict with its principle of harmony. Five copies of Can We Talk to God are available from Reverend Anne on a first come, first serve basis. If you don't get the book, I hope you'll remember the points that I made. Namaste.